Welcome to another edition of Jay Leno's Garage. Uh, today we're talking about motorcycles again. This is one of the rarest uh, motorcycles of all time, the uh, Vincent Series A Rapide. You've all heard of the Vincent Black Shadow, probably Black Lightning. Well, this is the one that preceded them all. This is the sort of granddaddy to those bikes. One of the rarest English bikes of all time, uh, although the Bruff Superior SS100 is considered one of the ultimate collectibles. This might even be above that because they built several hundred SS100s. They only built 78 of these. Some people think there might have been 79, I don't know, but 78 seems to be the number. This one is uh, number 50. Uh, this bike, I think, is one of the most beautiful bikes of all time, uh, just because it, like, a, like an insect, it's carried all its works on the outside. You know, that's kind of the cool thing about it. It has a kind of muscular beauty, I think, is very attractive. You got the short cylinders and the high camshaft. This was a bike that went 110 miles an hour in the 30s. Most motorcycles had a hard time hitting 80. There was all kinds of claims about people doing the ton, as they call it in England, 100 miles an hour. But this one could actually do it. Any pre-war bike that could go 110 miles an hour, there wasn't much stuff on the road much faster than that. A little brief history of, of Vincent. Philip Vincent started his company. He bought it from Howard uh, R. Davies. Howard Raymond Davies was a guy who won the TT. He built motorcycles. He built a bike called the HRD, and it says HRD right on there. Philip Vincent bought the company from him uh, in the late 40s, early 50s. They dropped the HRD because when the bikes came to America, people thought HR, oh, was that Harley R. Davison? They, somehow they confused it, V-Twin, and Philip Vincent uh, just made it the Vincent. First it was HRD, then the Vincent HRD, and then it just became uh, Vincent. But uh, this, for all intents and purposes, is the Vincent HRD. After the war, they come out with the Series B Rapide, and of course that led to the Black Shadow. Then they got rid of all the external oil lines and they put a stronger transmission in it. But uh, this was the first effort, and, and, and quite an effort it was as well. When Phil Irving bought uh, the HRD company, um, they were using sort of his suspension and chassis with uh, proprietary engines, whatever was available, JAP, Anzani, and uh, he didn't like that. He wanted to build his own motor, uh, so they came up with the, the uh, Vincent Single, 500cc. Phil Irving, the brilliant uh, engineer from uh, Australia, who I got a chance to meet in his later years, I think he was in his late 80s when I met him, and uh, he, he came here, and it was uh, quite an honor to meet him. And, uh, he designed the 500cc engine, 47 degrees, and they, sort of the rumor is they accidentally laid one blueprint on top of the other and said, hey, this would make a perfect V-twin. This is one of those apocryphal tales. I don't know if it was necessarily true, but uh, anyway, that's what they did. They essentially took two 500cc uh, single cylinder engines and made this V-twin. And the 500cc Meteor and Comet, those were fast motorcycles in their day, one of the, some of the fastest 500cc bikes available. So by combining the two of them, they came up with actually 998 cc's to come up with this Series A. Uh, the weak point in these was the transmissions. They were still using the, uh, the Berman box. It wasn't quite strong enough. And uh, a lot of these blew the transmissions apart because they just had too much power. In the day, these were quite fast. One of these uh, held the uh, standing quarter mile at 11.75, which is a pretty amazing number even by today's standards because that was a highly tuned one. I don't know how long his transmission lasted. <laughs> Probably not more than a couple of runs. The frame and suspension were altered just slightly from the single. It went from 55 inch to a 58 inch wheelbase, a heavier front down tube to the diamond frame. Vincent triangulated fork rear suspension, friction dampener, as I said, Brampton forks, two high camshafts operating these short push rods with fork rockers, valve spring running in split valve guides with external hairpin springs, just like on the single cylinder. The external bolt-on gear type oil pump. As you can see, the exhaust pipe's extremely tight fit. They look fine when they're on there. <laughs> Trying to fit them is an all-day job. But it's a pretty light bike, 430 pounds, pretty amazing. It's approximately 45 horsepower, which doesn't sound like much by today's standards, but 430 pounds, 45 horsepower, 6.8 compression ratio, and boat loads of torque. It was the, the, the fastest bike of the day. This is a bike, it, even today, you can run on the freeway 75, 80 miles an hour. It's dead smooth. Stops very nicely. Uh, stops better than almost any bike from the 30s. I mean, you have real brakes, as I said, with those uh, twin drums. And most of all, it's just a good-looking bike. I think this is one of the sexiest-looking motorcycles 
of all time. You have your split tank here. This side of the tank is gas, this side is oil. It's got a gravity feed, you turn it on here. Twin carburetors, or carburetors, as they say. Yeah, hairpin valve springs, very sexy. Kind of fun to watch them sort of go up and down. Got your pillion seat here. See the shock absorbers here under the seat? Most motorcycles of this period, the Indians, the Harleys, they were hardtails. This actually had suspension front and back. Well, this is one of the best stopping motorcycles of the period as well. Nobody else was doing this. Most had a little six or seven inch drum brake. This had two, so you had double the braking power of almost anything else on the road, and of course, uh, twice the speed of anything else on the road as well. Uh, you got your horn here, and you've just got, you just got oil lines everywhere. I mean, if you, you see why they called it the plumber's nightmare. You brake right here, you got a side stand, you got your toolbox, you can carry things in here, voltage regulator. Your shocks are adjustable here, a feature Vincent carried into all his motorcycles was the use of T-bars, and so you can break the axle free and adjust everything without tools. You know, most motorcycles, you gotta get your tool kit. This thing, you can just do this, pop the wheel, change it, and makes it fairly easy. I think this is the prettiest side right here. Uh, you've got your outside oil pump. Everything, everything is very cramped in here. It's not a lot of room. Here's your adjustment for the oil pump. How many drops per second? Drops per second. Well, there's a drop right there. These tend to mark their territory. Four speed box right here. Kickstarter, obviously. As your battery goes in here, six volt battery. Uh, this is all the little levers for your compression release that lifts the exhaust valve. This is uh, turn your gas on and off. And something very rare for this period rear suspension. You know, the funny thing is when you look in the manual, it says after 1,000 miles, disassemble engine, check everything, reassemble. Oh, no problem. Got your speedometer, your ammeter, your light switch, and something that was a real luxury back in the day, a clock. You've got an eight-day Jaeger clock right there. You've got your uh, clutch here. You've got your brake here. Twin chokes, one for each carburetor. Your advance and retard. High, low beam, horn button. And believe me, people are going to get out of the way when they hear that. They hear that coming. See, what you have to do is you have to shut the motorcycle off, tell everybody to go, shh. Oh, we hear it now. And then restart the bike. So the horn essentially is useless. And you have a compression release. For those of you that uh, grew up in the electric era, if you'd pull this, it would lift an exhaust valve. It would make it easier to kick the bike through because kicking 1,000 cc's, guys have been known to get thrown over the handlebars the, from, the, uh, from the kickback on the compression. By golly, I think it's time to go for a ride. You don't forget to turn on your oil. Turn on your gas on both sides. Get your full face helmet when riding these old bikes. We've talked about this before. It's a big beast to kick over. Got this broken toe, makes it hard to kick. Let's start it on the rollers. See how easy it starts. Let's take it for a ride. As you can see when it's running, the oil pump pumps the oil through the engine back up here into the tank. When you see it coming out there, you know all your oil is flowing freely. You know, it's hard to convey the impact a motorcycle like this had back uh, in the 1930s. You know, most motorcycles were 125, 250s, especially in Europe and England. Uh, to have almost a thousand cc's, 998 cc's, 45 horsepower, 430 pounds of weight, I mean, amazing. And this bike would pull away much like a modern bike today. You know, we live in an era where you can get a Kawasaki CX-14 or a Suzuki Hayabusa for what, 10, 11, 12 thousand uh, dollars. So consequently, people are used to seeing high performance vehicles. Back in the day, there was nothing like this. This and the Brough Superior, they were the kings of the world. Although the B Shadow and the C Shadow, or what you know as the Vincent Black Shadow, although they were a uh, more cleaned up version of this, uh, a little easier to manufacture, all the oil lines were internal, of course. There was nothing like one of these. This was meant to be a long distance cruiser, you know? You get on your motorcycle, you go over to France, 
Mountains Drive to the Isle of Mans. I would venture to say this is probably the fastest vehicle sold in England in the 30s. A bar none, cars, motorcycles, anything. It takes a long time to get this oil tank hot. There's a lot of oil in here. General rule of thumb is it takes a good 40 miles to warm up a Vincent, and I think that's true. But it's a wonderful shifting bike. Just touch the clutch, touch the gear lever, and it shifts. But you've got so much torque, you almost don't need the gearbox. You know, it's interesting, even people who know nothing about motorcycles know there's something special about this one. Whenever I park it somewhere, I always come back and there's a group of people standing around looking at it, asking questions. It just has a mechanical beauty. Kinetic artwork, that's what I would call it. But even in fourth gear, you can pull away quickly. Let's take it out on the freeway and open it up a little bit. There aren't many bikes from this period that can cruise at 70 or 75 miles an hour on the freeway and look this good doing it. Those exhaust pipes are not chrome, they're stainless steel, so they take out a nice golden glow when they get hot. I actually like that better than the chrome. You know, these have become such collector bikes that guys don't ride them anymore, and that's sad. I mean, you can treat them with respect, but you don't have to baby them. They took a beating when they were new, and they can do it again. I mean, I'm not doing burnouts and wheelies with this thing, but I, I drive it fairly hard, and that's where the real enjoyment is. In fact, that's what I'm going to do right now. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Away!